Carl Grant, I'm the interim dean at the University of Oklahoma Libraries. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, let me get going on the agenda here. So basically what I wanna cover with you in my 30 minutes is, what is voice search? Make sure we're all on the same page there. Should libraries be embracing voice search? Is this something you should be looking at or not? And I'll show you some data and information about that. I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing at voice search at OU Libraries and uh, just wrap it up real quick after that. So it be fairly quick. So let's just start with what is voice search? Let me find a place to throw my slides there. Okay, what is voice search? So basically, I think we're all pretty much familiar with this now. If you've got a cell phone these days, likely you're using it. You may have Alexa at home or Google Home. Um, you've got these devices floating around and you're using them more and more frequently. So basically, you say something and they they kick off and are ready to do a command that you execute. Maybe it's say, okay Google, or something like that. And, you, and it takes uh, your command, goes and executes it, and brings you back some results. So it's fairly straightforward what this is, and most people are now using it. What voice search will do is bring up questions of, is this a good value for the libraries to be investing in? That, I think, is uh, one of the very first questions you're gonna get asked. If you wanna invest in this, should you be? And the kind of questions you'll, you'll get asked is should libraries embrace voice search? Why are we investing in this technology when we already have perfectly functional discovery systems? Isn't this a luxury and not a core service? So, you know, people are going to ask about this when you say we're investing money in this. And obviously new technology comes and it goes. We've seen, for instance, Google Glass was a hot trend that never took off. And uh, so there's there's new technology that emerges, but in the classic book, uh, Crossing the Chasm, some things don't make it across the chasm. They fall into the chasm. And so we have to look and think about, okay, how do we decide whether or not we should invest in this? And I think it's a, it's a natural thing that voice searching would be, bring up questions about perceived value, and most new technology does. When OU Libraries is looking at this, we're looking at it from these angles, evaluating library innovation. Does it meet information-seeking needs? Is it gonna fill a need that's out there? Is the technology affordable and ubiquitous? That is key to us being able to say it's going to cross the chasm. It's gonna make it to the other side and be a, a permanent addition to our scene. And the last question we need to be asking, and you heard Cliff mention this today in his opening, is does it uphold our values, and particularly in the area of privacy? These are questions that we seriously owe it to ourselves to think about as we work with this technology. So I think I want to show you some data starting off to give you some indication of why we think you may want to be investing in this technology. And I think this one's a pretty interesting chart because it's saying, Look at the body of users that are out there. And when you look at the people that are making decisions right now, the millennials, the Generation X, the baby boomers, they are not as inclined to use this technology. Um, that is a group that is a little more skeptical about it, and they want to think about it more. Uh, but when you look at the younger people, you'll find out that these folks are actually very much embracing searching technology and are using it in big ways. Uh, they have really changing conceptions of how to get to information, how to use it, how to access it. Some interesting information in this report on, and this was two years ago, so then these kids are now two to, two to 10 years old, but look at these numbers. 98% live in a home with a mobile device same percentage as a TV. 95% of families have a smartphone now. This is you know, ubiquitous technology. 42% of children now have their own tablet device. So uh, more and more this technology is out there. So um, I think it's pretty clear information seeking needs is it's likely they're gonna be using these tools. In fact, if we look at the next set of statistics, what we found out is they use it to talk and play. 14% are already doing that right now. 10% use it right now to get information. And 7% use it to search for videos. If you look at the next stat, 5% are searching for jokes. They want humor. They're obtaining jokes in these things. 
3% are checking the weather, and 1% use it to make calls. Okay, so it's being used. It's out there, and it's getting used today. Now, this report is a very interesting one, and I thought what it was talked about was particularly interesting for our needs because it's pointing out that uh, reading and writing isn't really a prerequisite for them to use these devices. So that isn't a gating factor anymore. This age group, they can, they can use it as they are right now. Uh, let, and I think you really have to let that stat sink in a little bit. You don't have to be able to read and write to search for information anymore, right? That's, that's a pretty powerful statement. They go on to point out in here that young children are very curious and prolific information seekers. Anybody that's had a, big, a child knows this, right? Why, why, why? We've all been through that routine, why? Um, and this is, what's interesting about this is that these kids are, are willing to work with these devices to get that information answered for them. Um, and they understand when they have a gap in their understanding. So that's really important. They understand when they don't understand something. And the virtual assistants are really good at filling this gap. They do that quite well. And I think what's equally important is that when they are doing that, they're accessing a lot of content, right? There's, there's text-based results out there, but there's also an explosive growth of online video. We all know this. If you've watched YouTube and are dealing with YouTube, you know there's massive, massive amounts of content out there. And so kids want to access that. And I know when I talk to our campus IT people, they tell us YouTube is one of the most frequently accessed information resources on our entire, across our entire campus. YouTube is one of the most accessed things. And they're using these things to get to it. So we're seeing that explosive growth in content and we're seeing them use it. And it's because they can do this with uh, the natural language, right? They can just easily search, and they're doing more and more of this kind of searching and looking for uh, particularly videos to answer their information needs. This chart I thought was interesting. It had some, some very interesting stats in terms of how this information is being used. Uh, and it says where we're headed in the future. By 2020, uh, almost there, 50% uh, of all searches online will be voice search. 50% of all searches online will be voice search. That's a pretty powerful stat in and of itself. Two to five people say voice searches are essential to their lives today. They're using it. They believe it's going to continue to be important. 19% of people use it, use Siri every single day. Think about these stats. 55% of teens use voice search daily right now. So how ready are we for voice search? Well, I think the new study shows that about 4% of businesses have a voice search capability right now today. And the question, of course, we need to ask is what about libraries? Are we ready for this? Now. Another question about how ubiquitous this is. I think it's important to look at how many hours our kids are spending in front of their screen. And we look at this, and we can look at it by, um, by their average daily screen use, by teens and tweens. Now, tweens are those that aren't quite teens yet, but will be soon. And we're seeing, you know, tweens are already at four hours, almost five hours a day. You get into your teens, you're at almost seven and a half hours a day that you're in front of your screen. That's a lot. And of course, if you just semi-observational, just walk around even here, how many people are walking around with their phone in their face, right? It's everywhere. And so these screens, they're part of life now. We've got to be dealing with that little reality as we, as we move forward. All right. Next up. Let's look at the time spent watching online videos. And again, looking by these groups, you see some interesting numbers here. You're seeing that a lot of time is being spent looking at online videos. Uh, again, you've got to look at these numbers. We have teens and tweens again. The, the teens are the top number, uh, about 60 minutes. Um, 
and it's been growing from about 35 minutes, so the growth chart is pretty steep. We're looking at tweens. They were at 25 back in 2015. Uh, they're up to almost an hour uh, in the current environment, so a lot, a lot, a lot. And then we look at, for tweens, the YouTube is the dominant platform. That's where they're getting the majority of their information is out of that platform. So a lot of information going through YouTube. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the question of education and how do these personal devices, uh, personal assistants, play into this environment, particularly tutoring devices. And so what we're already seeing is that when they use personal tutoring devices, they have a much higher task outcome and a higher degree of collaboration quality. That's been researched and proven. That that's what happens when they can use those devices to get to information. So that's an interesting result. We can also look at how do they feel about that. And I think one of the interesting things about these personal assistants like this is that they're far more comfortable. They aren't react, interacting with a teacher who may apply pressure on them in different ways. They're not being judged. They can work at it at their pace, and therefore they build more confidence. A nice quote at the bottom of this slide about somebody that was using Alexa and how they felt in comparison to talking to a teacher about using this technology. And so I think we're seeing some, some interesting results in this technology and use of this technology. We move on and we talk about business. What are they doing today? Well, I imagine most of you have already had experiences with it. You travel, obviously. You travel to get here. You've probably dealt with some voice assistant on the airlines. A lot of the hotels are starting to use these now. And so we've seen Amazon fire up a partnership with Marriott, um, helps assist with the checkout procedures, and helps manage the room. These are um, having very, very high user satisfaction rates when they're doing this kind of work with these, with these devices. And so we're also seeing the healthcare sector use this a lot more. Again, if you've had any interaction with healthcare providers, you've undoubtedly been dealing with these. Sometimes you don't even know you're dealing with them. I'll get to that in a moment. But there's a lot more going on in the healthcare sector with this, a lot of basic routine transactions. Um, and even some more complex transactions are now being done using these personal assistants. All right, let's talk about business in the future a little bit. Where are they headed down the road? And I think these are some other interesting stats. Um, they're saying that by 2021, two years out, 25% um, of digital workers will have some kind of a virtual assistant that they're dealing with every day. So getting, getting more common. By 2023, 25% uh, of employee interactions with applications will be one, via one of these devices. So it's going to be quite getting quite prevalent out there. And I think some of the examples include, of course, things like Alexa for Business, uh, which is helping employees designate tasks right now, such as scheduling meetings and logistics. So we know um, Amazon's eating their own dog food here, and they're using it, uh, and managing their own company. The Google Duplex is an interesting other piece of technology that we're seeing get used. And again, <clears throat> it's allowing people to carry on very natural conversations. I don't know if, you, if you've heard this video that I'll play you in just a moment here, but their technology is getting quite as advanced in its ability to interact with you and sound like a real person without any question. We all know what the robotic sound of a, of a device can be, but it's improving pretty rapidly. And so we're getting to this place where it's being designed to sound totally natural and totally workable. So let me play you, if I can get this all to work here, uh, a, a short sound clip from Google Duplex. Okay. 
Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That is a totally automated device you're talking to that's doing that. That's pretty impressive, no matter how you look at it. So the other question, of course, we've got is, does this thing uphold our values? And that's a very critically important question, and we've got to come up with good answers for this. And right now, there are plenty of causes for concern. What I think we've seen is that we're finally building enough momentum out there and expressing concerns that at least they're starting to listen, and they're starting to design in parameters. But of course, the way it ships out the door isn't with those parameters set to protect you as users. So you got to go in when you start working with one of these devices and set the parameters. And if you are, you're setting it out there for the public to use, you need to be sure you're educating them how to set the parameters on their devices to protect them. Otherwise, these things can be listening all the time, virtually all the time or they can be capturing information about you that you don't want captured, it can be recorded. So there are concerns here. A lot of it you can now turn off in your settings through all of these news releases that have come out recently. There have been ways that you can go in and change your parameters. If you're gonna use one of these devices, do that. Protect yourself and then show your users how to protect themselves. There's lots of articles out there like these. these are ones that I just grabbed and clipped and put up here. And this has all just been within the last six months. So it's really starting to change. But we have to keep the pressure up and we have to educate our communities before we allow them to use this technology. All right, I think some of the questions that of course we started with were, should we be embracing this technology? And I think the answer is yes, we have to embrace this technology. Uh, Generation Z and, and our Gen Alpha have radically different information-seeking behavior. That's just the way it is. Uh, and so we've got to be getting ready for them. They're coming at us soon. Some are already in our colleges. Uh, some of our youngest students in our colleges are already doing this stuff. And you can, you can again, walk across your campus and just observe how many of them are asking questions of their phone. It's happening. But the question is, can they get to your library? Can they ask a question of your library? And if they can't, well, I don't think that's good. I think we have to be everywhere these things exist. So I think it's important that we're out there. In five to 10 years, I think these things are gonna be all sectors of society, it's gonna be everywhere, and we're gonna to need to be working with it. It's the same kind of step change in information, really, that we saw the, what happened with the computer versus the card catalog, right? It's gonna be a big, big shift in what's happening here. And that means you want to be getting ready for it. Um, I think we need to really pay attention to doing ethical development of this software. And <clears throat> this is a, can be a challenge if you're working with a third party vendor. I think that's another concern we have to have is making sure that that vendor buys into our values and or gives us the parameters to support our values in working with this technology. Um, if it's in, you're building it in-house, then it's a little easier to do this and support it in the future. All right, so what are we doing with it at OU Libraries? Well, we believe we should be using this technology, and so we are. Now, the way we did it is a little different, I think, because we started with a chat bot that is driven by artificial intelligence. And if you were here last year and came to one of my sessions, you probably heard me talking about this. So we did something that's called Busy, and it's a chat bot that runs when librarians aren't available in the library. So usually it's after hours. We are open till two in the morning. We reopen at seven. So between two and seven in the morning, uh, we're running this chat bot. And it will take a whole range of questions and provide you answers. And we've used some parameters to do this with. But we have a whole bunch of um, Echo Dots, Amazon Echo Dots in dorm rooms. And that's where we're headed towards. That's why we're taking what we've done with an AI chat bot and making sure that we can put voice search capabilities on top of it so all those echo dots that they put in the dorm rooms when they built the new dorm can be used to search the library. I don't want the library not to be on their list of things that they can access and search. So here's a basic chart that shows you what we've been doing with our chat bot. So uh, 
uh, basically, we're working through API layers, layers um, and our chatbot primarily is talking to libguides and it's talking to Primo, uh, both of those through standard API calls that are supported by the vendors. So we've got our software and third-party software that's sitting there running on top of that, and we built the infrastructure so that we can translate calls into API calls and get it back and hand it to them in a, in a format that is natural language, is what we're doing. Now you may wonder about the kind of usage we're seeing of that uh, between those hours, and that's at 7 p.m., it's actually 2, 2 a.m. Uh, to 7 p.m. Um, anyway, about 3,700 questions get asked, uh, have been asked since we opened this thing up in July of 2019. The accuracy, we ask the user when they get an answer, do you feel like that was an accurate answer? And they've ranked it at about 88% accuracy. Now we take all of those queries and we review them to make sure that the query is accurate. If not, we tweak it. And we don't keep those queries, we get rid of them. But we review them before we do to make sure the system is working. This is all in a sandbox and we make sure they know that. It's interesting that they've had about 1,300 different topics of conversation asked in the, in the chatbot so far. Um, and out of that, about 1,500 links have been clicked from within the chatbot. And 9 a.m. seems to be the most popular time to use this thing. And Tuesday seems to be the most popular day. Uh, probably because they all come in on Monday and get loaded down with homework assignments and go home and do their thing. Now, one of the other things we've done with all of the questions that we take in and process with our chatbot is we've used the read scale, which you can find this out on the, on the web. There's a link. And this ranks the complexity of reference questions from one to six. And we've limited the chatbot to currently only answering questions at level one and level two. Now, why would we do that? Well, one of the reasons we did that is because obviously we want to be able to look at what it's doing. We can't deal with a whole range of questions. We also wanted to build confidence with our staff that they were comfortable that they were working with this tool and could see the value it was providing. But the other thing is because we want to be very careful, and particularly when you're working with a third-party vendor and your data is likely going in and going to be the basis of a system that will be sold to others, you want to make sure you're not putting in biased data. And we see that as a really ethical issue for librarians that if we're going to do that, we have got to spend time reviewing that data and the answers that were provided to make sure those responses are not biased. And so we're building a whole infrastructure inside the library to review every question. We're working with our diversity team at the university to assemble a panel to review answers, to make sure that all various parties are concerned. And of course, in, in Oklahoma, we have 39 Indian, Native American Indian tribes that we've got to deal with, plus all the other 122 countries' students that we're dealing with, so there's a lot to be considered here. Uh, as we're doing that, we're trying to note the specific steps we're doing to make sure that we move data from being potentially biased to unbiased, and then we'll go back and try and automate those steps so that as we move forward, we can continue to feed information in and get it cleaned up before we would move it into a long-term uh, set of answers. So it's complicated, uh, but we're holding it back to the only levels one and two until we get more comfortable that we feel that what we're putting in here is unbiased. So now we're introducing voice search. So it really, it goes right, right into the chart. You can see where the circle is. It goes in right where we currently have the chat bot. Um, same thing, it's just a different method of input, but we're writing all this software ourselves. Uh, so our programmer Tim has is, is designed this and built it and has got a basic interface going. And we have shown it to students. Uh, I, I, they gave me instructions and I could demo it here, but I'm going to let these folks demo their product and not do mine since I'm going to be short on time. Um, and you'll, you'll see how this works. But I think it's interesting. We've demoed it for the students at our university, and they liked it. In fact, they liked it so much they asked that we start working on these capabilities to be able to do this via voice search. So you can see the list. It's quite extensive. A lot of things they want us to be able to do for them as we move forward. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Iowa State and let them talk about what they're doing. Hello everybody, I'm Greg Davis from Iowa State University and Lisa? Uh, I'm Lisa Smith. 
Smith from Iowa State University. So we're going to tell you a little bit about a project we've been working on uh, called Parks Libro. And so my part of the presentation is I get to do the basic PowerPoint slide deck. And then Lisa gets to do the live demo here in a hotel room we've never been in before with beta <laughs> software. So you, you can decide who got the better deal here. But we got our fingers crossed, and it's going to go good. So, so here we go. So Carl already talked a lot, a lot about um, what, here's what we're doing today's presentation. Carl already talked about the things happening around us out there in the world with smart assistants and reasons why we might want to be thinking about doing them here in our academic library. Uh, in my slide deck, I've got like four or five slides worth of these industry statistics. And I posted our slides up to the SCED site for CN the CNI meeting. So if you want to get the stats, you find them there. But I'm not going to take a lot of time today to talk about the stats. Just like Carl indicated, there's just lots of motivating factors out there that I think makes would make li academic libraries want to think about smart assistants and how they might play into into our world. So, so yeah. So, for us at Iowa State, this was probably a couple years ago. We started to look at these industry statistics, and we we decided, well, it's probably going to happen. You know, it's uh, it's not really a question of when it's going to happen. It's it's just, um, I mean, it is a question of when. It's not if. And so we wanted to start thinking about, well, how are we going to think about that? And so we thought about it. We tried to think about it from a strategic planning point of view. You know, how can we be strategic about this? And a couple, again, a couple years ago when we got started with the Smart Assistant Project, it was, you were sitting there thinking, you know, sooner or later, the vendors are going to start putting this stuff into the product. And it might be bundled in out of the box, or it might be something you have to pay extra for. But, you know, sooner or later, that's going to happen. It just has to. So why, why would we want to go through the pain and suffering of developing something ourselves only in who knows how long before it just comes out of the box and we can throw our other stuff away. So, so we thought about that, you know, do we really want to, to try to do some things to experiment with this? And, and uh, we decided, yeah, well, let's take a shot at it. At least we'll learn about what the technology is about and how it works and just gain a better understanding of, of the technology. Even if vendors come along eventually and replace what we did with something better, uh, that's a good thing. At least we'll be a step ahead and know more about what's happening with this type of technology. And, and in fact, just what has recently happened is here at Iowa State, we are an Ex Libris customer. We use Alma and Primo. And uh, I think in the next quarterly release of Primo, which I think is this month, uh, they're going to add a microphone to the Primo search box. And so you can click on the microphone and type in your search or voice your search request, and it will uh, do the translation and do your Primo search for you. So that's not necessarily a true voice assistant, but it's a step in that direction. And so you can see that some of these technologies are starting to make their way into the off-the-shelf product. So what we did at Iowa State, instead of uh, uh, creating a team of developers like uh, Carl did at Oklahoma, uh, we decided to look outside the university and see would there be a, developer, a development partner out there that we could work with to do our experiment. And uh, it turned out that, well, there's probably more than one, but we found at least one out there. It was a company called Kubnersite. Cub yeah, Kubnersite. And uh, they had a product in the public library sector called Libro. And so we talked to them and said, hey, would you be interested in working with us to adapt your Libro project, your product, to work in academic libraries? And they were willing to work with us. And so we you know, signed the contract. And for a couple years now, we've been working with uh, this company to develop the Libro product. And actually, what we did, each, each version of Libro is uh, specific to the library it's working in. So at Iowa State University, our library is Parks Library. And so we branded our Libro product as Parks Libro. And so you'll see in the demo that we'll be asking Parks Libro questions. That's the version of Libro that's specific to the Iowa State University library. So we've gone through a couple phases. So phase one of our project was, uh, was really focused on Amazon Alexa. And, uh, and we had concerns right from the start about sharing personal information. And we had concerns about what's, going, what's Amazon going to do with this information when we capture it in their cloud and all those things. And so we sort of drew a line and said, our first version of the app is not going to use any personal information, which is a good thing, but also it limits what the app can do. You know, it can't tell you what books you have checked out because it doesn't know who the heck you are. 
So about the best it can do is it can do a search, you know, and tell you what books the library has, but it can't check it out to you because, again, it doesn't know who you are. So we're not sharing personal information. So that's a good thing in terms of not sharing PII stuff, but also limited what the app could do. But it was a, it was a really good starting point, and again, it was a skill that we developed in the Amazon store, and it was out there that anyone could implement the skill in Alexa and use the skill to search the Iowa State catalog. And like Carl said, we're using APIs, and so the Libro app is using the Primo APIs to do the Primo searches. We also connected it to our LibCal product, our SpringShare Spring LibCal, and so you can use the SpringShare APIs to search for events, and you can search for library hours. And so those were the kinds of searches we set up in the, verse, in the first phase of our project. Again, not, none of it required personal information. Then phase two, which is currently what we would call ourselves currently in phase two, uh, we advanced the product in terms of trying to find ways that we could actually do more with it, even though it required the ability to, for people to log in and share who they were as they came into the smart assistant. And the way we decided to handle that is that we had our developer actually sort of create a mobile app wrapper that sort of wraps around Amazon Alexa. And so we're still using Amazon Alexa, but what happens is our mobile app is the interface. And so you, you enter your query into our mobile app, and then the mobile app captures that and creates a package that it sends to Amazon Alexa. And then Alexa does the voice language translation and sends back the request to the mobile app. And then the mobile app does the API calls and returns the information that the user is looking for. And so what we're doing with that is we're able to keep the personal information sort of one step removed from Amazon. And the other thing we do is that it still requires the user to set up an Amazon Alexa account. And so um, we, we think there's some ability there that users have some control if they want to opt into this or not. It's not as good as we'd like. We'd like it to be a big red button saying, here's all the things you need to be aware of before you opt into it. But at least it's a start in terms of giving users some ability to decide if they really want to participate. In, this, in the current version of the software, they actually have to, do, they have to sign up for an Alexa account and so that's, that's a step to get started with it, with it going. So that's the current phase of the, of the project. And what it added to the mix is now you can say, what items do I have checked out? You can say, I want to check out this item. You can check information about what fines and fees you might have. There's just more things you can ask the app because you've, you've told it who you are, and it can do more things on your behalf, hopefully in a somewhat more secure way instead of just going directly to Amazon Alexa. OK, and we're looking at phase three of our project, which should be in the coming springtime to 2020. And uh, still using the mobile app interface, but providing an option, our developer is going to provide an option that doesn't rely on the Amazon Alexa voice engine. So they'll have another way to actually capture the voice and convert it to text and do the queries for us without necessarily having to use Amazon Alexa. And we'll see how that works out. I imagine we'll have different versions of the, of the software. So you can choose to use the Alexa version if you want. You can choose to use the non-Alexa version. There'll be different flavors of our apps that users can opt into based on their knowledge and comfort level and, and what they want to do with the application. The other thing that will happen in the new version is that we'll actually be able to have a, a chat interface with our product as well. So you won't be limited just to doing voice queries. You can actually use it in a chat mode with a chat box and type your queries into the, the tool. And at first I thought that was, you know, that's sort of nice, but yeah, who's ever going to use it? And then our library hired a deaf employee who can't really use the voice recognition stuff, and she's really excited about our ability now to add chat into our smart assistant and have that kind of an interface with our assistant in addition to voice. Plus you have all the other accessibility things that come along for the ride in terms of language translations and just lots of cool things from an accessibility point of view that we really like about our smart assistant work. And uh, again, you say you might look at this and say, "Well, again, Greg, this is all just going to come down the road. You know, why are you why are you doing this? You know, why don't you just wait a few years and just let it naturally happen?" And but there was one thing that that we noticed that the research company Infotech actually did some work, and they claim that. Uh, your users perceive you better if you are seen as being innovative. If you are a library IT group and you're perceived as being innovative, 
the users that you support will see you in a better light, that they'll, they'll give you more support, and they'll be more supportive of the work you're doing. And we see our work with things like smart assistants as being in the innovative realm. And so we think we get some credits and brownie points for doing that kind of work. You know, even though this might not be a product that you know, lives for a long, long time, it's a good starting point, and I think it puts us in a good position in terms of being perceived as an innovative in, uh, in the academic library world. And the last slides I had was, and again, along those lines, you know, you can look at this and say, well, what's the risk reward? You know, what, what are the risks with developing your own smart assistant? And if you're successful, you know, there's not a lot of risk. You know, it's, it's good news if, you're, if you take the risk and you're successful, then you've got some good things going on. But even if you take the risk and you're not successful, you can still get some benefits um, from, from giving it a good try and learning from the mistakes that you may be made and, and taking that and building on that experience. And if you don't act, then you're, you're really no better off than you were before. You know, if you don't take the risk, OK, you, you didn't take the risk, so you don't have to worry about the risk, but you also maybe didn't move yourself forward as much as you could have if you would have given it a shot. OK, so with that, we're going to uh, attempt to do the live demo here with our Parks Libro app. And Lisa gets the chance of doing that. <laughs> Okay, so unlike Amazon, where it's always listening, I have to activate the microphone. I'm going to press the button here. Open Park Sleepro. Hello, Greg. Welcome to Parks Libro. You can now explore in the library. Here is your today's update. You have one item on hold. You have checked out a total of five items. You can ask questions like, can you search a book? Can you cancel an item or list all my items on hold? Go through your user guide to learn more. How may I assist you? Ask to list all books on hold. You have one item on hold. Air war. This item is in hold shelf. Do you want to unhold? No. What else can I do for you? Ask the list to book. Let. Okay, stop it. <laughs> I am not trained on this request. I know. Can you ask differently? <laughs> what else I can do for you? Ask to list the books ready for pickup. I don't see any available items for pickup right now. Please try again later. What can I do for you? Ask to list all books checked out. You have checked out a total of five items. Option one, managing with data, using April metrics and PL metrics. Peter Hernan, Robert E. Dugan, Joseph R. Matthews. The due date is May 8, 2020. Option two, Strategy maps, converting intangible assets into tangible outcomes. There's five of them. It's a long list. <laughs> you have already authenticated. Please go ahead with your questions. Ask for the event for today. No events available right now. What can I do for you? I'm going to reopen Parks Libro because sometimes it Shuts itself off, and we're going to try to reactivate it here. Mm. Open Parks Libro. Hello, Greg. Welcome to Parks Libro. You can now explore in the library. Here is your today's update. You have one item on hold. Ask for events for today. No events available right now. What can I do for you? Ask for an event next week. Here is the event I found, Library Staff Holiday Luncheon. 
on December 19, 2019, starts at 12 p.m. and ends at 1 p.m. No registration required. Event is organized by Greg Davis. What can I do for you? Okay, so now I figured out why I didn't list the event because it's already in progress. So that first one that I asked for event, it was this event, and it's already um, going on. So I'm assuming that's why I didn't say Bad anything. Planning. Bad planning. Open Parks Libro. Hello, Greg. Welcome. Ask if the Parks Library is open December 20th. Parks Library is available on December 20th, 19, from 7.30 a.m. until 7 p.m. What can I do for you? Ask if the Media Center is open today. Media Center is available today until 12 a.m. What can I do for you? Ask if the Parks Library is open today. Parks Library is closed on December 9th, 19, but will be open on December 19th, 2019 from 7.30 a.m. until 2 a.m. What can I do for you? Okay, so Greg and I figured out why that is. So in our LibCal, we, we are actually open 24 hours here the last two weeks of uh, cl well, classes are in session. So until next week, the library does not close, therefore it's not open. <laughs> open Parks Libro. Hello, Greg. Welcome to Parks Libro. Asked to provide my current fee status. I am not trained on this request. Can you ask differently? What else I can do for you? I think that concludes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so not too bad on the live demo, huh? Give it for Lisa. <laughs> All right, so that's the presentation we had to show you our Parks Liberal application. And I guess the, I would conclude this by just saying if you're there are some other academic libraries out there that are also working with the company that we're working with to develop the parts, the Libro tool. And, uh, and they've actually been taking it farther than we did when we started with it. So if any of you happen to be interested in, part, in the Libro tool and maybe would want to get in touch with our developer to see if there's any, any interest in contributing to the code base, I'd invite you to do that. And if you need some contact information on that, just let Lisa or I know and we'll be glad to get you in touch with the developer and you can see what they can do for you. So with that, I think we're ready to see if you have any questions.